Wednesday, everybody. Um, I am Allie. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my journey with Lyme disease and with Dapsone and double Dapsone therapy. Um, but first, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about Dr. Richard Horowitz. Not that he really needs any introduction, because if you have Lyme disease, you know who Dr. Horowitz is. Um, but Dr. H has become a very, very dear friend and um, even outside of my Lyme disease battle. And um, I'm grateful for all that he does to advance the lives of patients like me and like you. So first of all, Dr. Richard Horowitz is a board certified internist and the medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center. He specializes in the treatment, treatment of tick-borne disorders and has treated over 13,000 Lyme disease patients in the past 30 years. He was a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Tick-Borne Disease Working Group and many, many other governmental panels. Dr. Horowitz is the author of three books that you probably know, love, and have read, Why Can't I Get Better? Solving the Mystery of Lyme and Chronic Disease, how Can I Get Better? An Action Plan for Treating Resistant Lyme and Chronic Disease, and an eco-thriller, as I like to call it, Starseed Revolution. Um, if you have not read the three books, I highly, highly recommend. So Dr. H, thanks for spending your Wednesday night with us. No, oh, Thanks, Abby. It's great to be here. Um, so throughout the night, we'll have a couple of patient testimonials. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and then we'll kind of get into what Dapsone is. And um, we'll also hear from Lee Horowitz who battled Lyme for 20 plus years and went into remission from Dapsone therapy and has been in remission for four years. Um, so if we haven't had the pleasure to meet yet, my name is Ali Moresco. I am a nine year Lyme patient. Um, like many people, it took me two years to get diagnosed, which I know, unfortunately, is on the shorter end of diagnosis. Um, I was diagnosed with everything under the sun except for Lyme disease and tick-borne illness. Um, and eventually, when I received my diagnosis, I was essentially bedridden. I was bedridden for two years. Um, my symptoms included losing my memory at the age of 21, um, severe muscle and joint pain. Um, as Dr. Horowitz knows, when he began working with me, I couldn't really eat any food, any solid food. Um, when I did eat, I would get very severe um, hives and histamine reactions, um, just extreme chronic fatigue um, and pain all the time um, and was probably operating at about 50%, which I have learned over the last year was probably generous. Um, to give myself. And I've been working with Dr. Horowitz for about almost a year and a half now. Um, and I've undergone Dapsone, double Dapsone. Um, and then I did do a short quad Dapsone pulse, which I don't know if we'll get into today, but I did all three. And I can say that I made more progress with Dapsone in the last year than I have in the last nine combined. Um, I am a huge advocate of Dapsone therapy now. Um, overall now, I would say I'm operating closer to like 80 to 85%, um, which is obviously a massive jump. Um, I'm not in constant chronic pain anymore. I have enough energy to get me throughout the day. I mostly sleep at night. Um, I can eat solid food and with very little um, reactions now. And I felt good for a while. Um, so if you have any other questions, you can always feel free to reach out to me on Instagram at Allie T. Moresco. And I'm always happy to be a resource. And um, I am always happy to answer any other questions about Dapsone or Dapsone therapy. So that's a little bit about me and my journey. So first of all, Dr. H, the number one question that I get, that I get what is Dapsone therapy? So Dapsone is, um, it's an antibiotic that's been around for a very long time, over 50 years. Uh, the reason I kind of knew to use Dapsone and thought about using it was when about seven years ago, John Hopkins researchers had published that Lyme is a, quote, persister bacteria, meaning mm -hmm. not that it persists in the body per se, we knew that already. There was a lot of articles already in the journals about persistence, but that it persisted like certain other bacteria, like mycobacteria, mycobacterium mm -hmm. tuberculosis, mycobacterium leprae, which persist in a very specific way in the body. Um, and they found that it was under biofilm. So Dapsone is an antibiotic. It's been used for leprosy. So for example, rifampin and Dapsone for one year, is generally considered a cure for leprosy. 
So if you have mm -hmm. another persister bacteria that causes chronic illness, leprosy, Mycobacterium leprae, they use rifampin and dapsone for one year. Um, the dapsone dose is normally 100 milligrams per day, and people will go into remission. So I kind of came up with the idea and uh, looking at those past studies that I wanted to get a drug that had already been used for another persister bacteria with success. So as obvious it might've seen as I just looked at it and went, well, if rifampin and dapsone is curing leprosy or putting people at least in long-term remission, why don't I just add some doxycycline or minnow at a tetra and make it doxy minnow rifampin dapsone, a persister drug regimen, and let me see what happens. And the way this started was back in 2016, I published my first study on dapsone. It was in 100 patients. And at the time I was playing around with the dose because I didn't really know um, how to use dapsone properly. And, and it actually mm -hmm. scared me the first time when I used it because this woman that I gave dapsone to who went up to 100 milligrams, the standard leprosy dose, um, I got on the phone with her about a month later and I got her labs back before she got on the phone and I went, oh my God, she's anemic. What is going on? <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, she's going to be tired. She's going to feel terrible. It's like, what's going to happen? And she gets on the phone and I go, how you doing? Great. It's like, you're, you're tired? You're, oh my God, I have so much energy. I don't even know what to do with it. It's like, what? It's like, you're anemic. It's like, doc, I feel the best I've ever felt in the last 10, 15 years. It's like, what? Yeah. So I started getting these early reports. And the thing that's interesting about Dapsone, when you look at the quality of the drug is it's anti-inflammatory. So it lowers mm -hmm. down something in the white cells called myeloperoxidase. So that alone helps lower inflammation. In fact, for people out there who are like concerned about the use of Dapsone, it was shown in a 15 year controlled randomized trial in Alzheimer's in leprosy patients that the patients that took Dapsone for 15 years straight, their Alzheimer's rates were close to zero. And the leprosy patients that did not take Dapsone, the leprosy rates were four or five times tick higher. So mm -hmm. Dapsone, Dapsone actually was shown to have, they called it in the article, an anti-catalyst cata catalyst for Alzheimer's disease, meaning it stopped it actually from happening as a prevention protocol in this population. And um, they have found Lyme ender Alzheimer's biofilms, right? Mm -hmm. Borrelia burgdorferi has been found in Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean Lyme causes Alzheimer's, but it may be one of these causality factors that's driving inflammation in the microglia of the brain, mm -hmm. causing these type of neurodegenerative diseases with the misfolding of proteins with amyloid and tau. And in any mm -hmm. case, so Dapsone has been around for a long time. They use it for a specific form of colitis, um, when people can't get better from it. It's been used for acne for many years. They use it for Bassett syndrome, a very severe autoimmune disease. So Dapsone had been used for several other diseases, at least four, way before mm -hmm. I ever started using it for Lyme. And this first paper we did in 2016, we used between 25 and 100 milligrams. Some people took Doxy, some people didn't, some people took Rifampin. We kind of were playing with the drug and we found that Dapsone improved um, statistically eight major Lyme symptoms. The only one in that particular study that wasn't helped was headaches, but fatigue got better, joint pain got better, muscle pain got better, nerve pain, but cognition way, way better. Babesia symptoms with sweats and chills got better. Sleep got better. So all the major symptoms, right, got better from it. But we noticed when we stopped the drug, people relapsed. So we published a second study that same year, are mycobacterium drugs effective for um, autoimmune resistant autoimmune illness. And this is actually a Bisset patient who had been treated for 20 years with what we call DMAR drugs, disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Arava, Embrel, she was on uh, TNF alpha inhibitors, prednisone. She was so osteoporotic with a T-score minus than six that this woman would have fallen over, she would have broken everything and nothing was helping her Bissets. So it's, after 20 years of being ill, when she came to see me, I put her on Dapsone, the Dapsone protocol, Doxy, Rifampin, Dapsone. Now, again, mm -hmm. Dapsone's been published for Bissets, but it wasn't particularly getting it well enough. It got better. Her symptoms were improving. So I decided to use another mycobacterium drug they use for tuberculosis called pyrazinamide. So pyrazinamide is part of what I would call the yin-yang protocol described by Ying Zhang from Hopkins, where you have to combine drugs when you're trying to hit a bug like Lyme. You have mm -hmm. to use organisms, uh, I'm sorry, antibiotics that hit the actively growing organisms, but you also need to hit the persister forms and the reverters, the ones that are going to revert back to these active bacteria. So by putting together a protocol 
of rifampin, pyrazidamide, and dapsone, which are all persister drugs, right, used for tuberculosis or leprosy in this case with dapsone, we found that when we put this together and we added a tetracycline and then we added Zithromax, a macrolide, could be biaxin. The reason for that is in culture, our fourth or fifth Dapsone study showed in culture that Dapsone was effective against the biofilm forms of Borrelia. So we published it about three years ago with Eva Shapi's group from the University of New Haven that it wasn't just clinically work, work, but we saw that when we put it in culture, the biofilm forms of Borrelia were significantly decreased at 72 hours in a three drug regimen, but when you did a four drug regimen with Zithro, it was even better, like 3% better. And that's what Hopkins also showed in culture. Mm -hmm. And that's what Monica Embers has now showed, which is mm -hmm. monotherapy, one drug does not work for this disease. And this year, Monica even published a preprint that's not yet published on mice using Dapsone, that we mm -hmm. now have an animal model that rifampin and Dapsone knocked Borrelia out of the mice. It was gone. Finito couldn't find it. So we now have an animal model where Dapsone mm -hmm. is, in a sense, curing. We don't like to use that word in Lyme, but maybe curing the mm -hmm. mice. You could not find any more infection. In biofilms, it's lowering it down. And then we started publishing new studies on higher doses of Dapsone. Precision Medicine 1, Precision Medicine 2, published in the International Journal of General Medicine and Healthcare. And there we showed in 200 more patients. Now we're up to 300 clinical patients. Dapsone statistically helped eight major Lyme symptoms, fatigue, pain, joint pain, muscle pain, nerve pain, um, cognitive issues, sleep, right? So all of the basic symptoms, including Babesia symptoms got better. But what kept happening is when people came off the protocol, if they had Babesia or Bartonella, the protocol was not as effective. So we had to figure out another way of using this to figure out, well, how do we kick the Babesia and Bart to get the efficacy of the Dapsone protocol higher? So Hopkins had then published several years ago on Bartonella, that Bartonella is a persister bacteria under biofilms, just like Lyme. So what they showed in culture is that you needed six days of rifampin, zithromax, and methylene blue. So here's your next persister drug, your fourth persister drug in the Dapsone protocol. That if you did this, you did this for six days, it would eliminate Bart persisters, at least in culture. Now, what John Hopkins didn't tell us is, what were the doses of the medications? And what was the dose of the methylene blue that was needed to actually work? So we did the next study, which you just talked about that you took, which was double dose mm -hmm. Dapsone combination therapy, published in the journal Antibiotics in 2020. And there we had 40 patients who had failed double dose Dapsone, meaning they got better, but they relapsed. We mm -hmm. then gave them a higher dose of Dapsone. It now went from 100 to 200 milligrams for one month. And that's exactly what my wife Lee did. And she'll tell you a whole story. She'll come on in just a little bit. But she was sick for 20 to 25 years, took 50 milligrams of Dapsone for like six months, stopped it, really felt great, stopped it. And the Lyme PCR for Borrelia burgdorferi was positive in her blood. She then went on 100 of Dapsone. She doubled the dose for a year, felt great. All her symptoms were much better. Stopped the Dapsone. It relapsed. I then turned to her after a patient in my practice, and most people know this story, who accidentally took a double dose of Dapsone. This is how I came up with this idea. I just kind of follow the universe and where it's leading me. And this guy came in and said, hey doc, I feel horrible. I'm herxing like crazy. I said, well, what are you taking? Well, you know, I'm taking Dapsone twice a day. I went, oh my God, you're taking too much. It's like, stop and come back in a month. Came back in a month, his symptoms were gone. He only did like four to six months of antibiotics. He was sick for years. I followed him for a year, he stayed in remission. So I realized, okay, Dapsone needs to be at a double dose for Lyme. And I finally gave it to Lee, and she'll talk about this, for one month of double dose Dapsone. And she's been in remission for over four years. It was the dose of Dapsone and the length of time for these persister bugs that you got to be on it for a certain period of time for it to work. So the double dose Dapsone is eight weeks. It's an eight week oral generic protocol using a tetracycline like doxymino with rifampin. You could use rifabutin, Zithromax. Could be biaxin, but Zithromax has less interactions um, with Dapsone and methylene blue. In the double dose, the methylene blue starts the second month. We this way we keep down methemoglobin levels, which is one of the side effects of Dapsone. Because the major side effects of Dapsone I can describe easily as do no harm. H is Herxheimer reactions, A is anemia, because Dapsone interferes with folic acid pathways in the body, the way you make your red cells. You can get rashes mm -hmm. if you're severely sulfur allergic, but fortunately, most people who are even Bactrim allergic, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, 
They can take it with no problem. If I suspect it, I will give them an H1, H2 blocker like Zyrtec mm. and Pepsid. And the last is methemoglobinemia, where you don't carry oxygen as well in the body, which happens from oxidative stress from higher doses of dapsone. The beauty of methylene blue is that's what you use to reverse methemoglobin. So in the later protocols, we're now using higher and higher doses of methylene blue. You just can't be on any psychiatric meds, uh, narcotics. There's a bunch of medicines that are your contraindication mm -hmm. for doing it. But that study of 40 patients showed that about one third of these patients went into long-term remission for one year or longer doing the double dose dapsone now with a high dose dapsone pulse, right? Which is the, the seventh dapsone study published last year in antibiotics, right? If we gave them four days of dapsone at 400, upping the dose with now higher doses of methylene blue, those people who kept relapsing with Barton Babesia, about a third of them went into long-term remission. And the eighth study, which is in peer review, and I heard from the editor of the journal that it's been accepted, but um, I have not heard back from the journal and I'm wondering if Lyme politics, I hope this is not the case, because the third reviewer for this journal was an IDSA reviewer who basically said, well, you know, those ILADS doctors, they're charlatans. And, uh, you know, didn't even, by the way, review the article, attacked my character and said, you know, this guy owns a salt cave in Poughkeepsie, New York and runs a spa. Well, the guy didn't do a proper Google search. There is a Hudson Valley healing center in Poughkeepsie. That's a salt spa and, you know, salt cave and spa. He didn't even bother to take the time to look up where I practice medicine. These are the kind of reviewers, by the way, for those of you out mm -hmm. there who've ever tried publishing, you got to get some doctors who know what they're doing and are not biased. So in any case, mm -hmm. the uh, editor yesterday told me it had been accepted. She was letting the journal know after coffee, it's going on 48 hours. I've not heard back. So um, I, I won't let my uh, fears get out of control that politics is playing a role. I had to send them letters from HHS and the FDA regarding my character because I was worried that this IDSA reviewer was basically going to um, you know, stop this article from being published. But the other two reviewers loved the article. So did the editor. Uh, and in fact, reviewer one, who I think I know who it is, made great suggestions. This article started at 88 pages. I could have called it my third book. Then it was 58 pages. I think now it's 45, but it's like 20 pages of references. Um, and all the tables of how to do double dose dapsone and quad dapsone what nutritional supplements? Where do you get the nutritional supplements from? What are the drugs? It is laid out in detail week by week. What are the blood tests I have to do? When should I go for an electrocardiogram? Because Plaquenil, Zithromax, and Zofram on a Centron, which is needed for nausea in many patients on the higher doses of Dapsone, can affect the QT interval on the cardiogram. So you want to get an EKG before you do this protocol. Mm -hmm. You want to get an EKG when you're on Zithro and Plaquenil, and you're going to take some Zofran for nausea to make sure your QT mm -hmm. is fine. And we follow the labs you know, weekly on double dose Dapsone for the anemia. But what we did in this last study, where we compared a six-day dose of Dapsone, of high-dose Dapsone to four. So, so remember, the seventh study, another 25 patients, was four days of high dose dapsone. This eighth study, which is mm -hmm. by the way, the last dapsone study I plan on publishing, I'm ready now for an FDA randomized trial. I'm ready, I got it, I'm there. This last study of 25 patients were patients, many of these patients over 40% had active Bartonella. They were Bartonella fish positive or had positives from Galaxy Labs or from T Labs or from local labs. So many of these patients, 84%, in this 25 patients were BART positive, many of them fish positive, okay, active. And what we showed is if we followed the Hopson research, Hopkins research in culture, and we looked at six days of zithro, rifampin, and methylene blue is what Hopkins said was needed to kill BART. We found that when we extended the dapsone pulse, the high dose pulse from four days to six days, we got rates of about 43.5% of people going into long-term remission. Now, these were people that had either relapsed from double dose dapsone or high dose dapsone. So the only difference in this eighth study, and now we're up to about 400 clinical patients, is that this last study was basically done in patients with active Bartonella, two thirds of them had active Babesia, um, three different species. And what we found in this article, and this is, I think, going to rock the Lyme world because no one, this is brand new information that no one has heard because you've not seen this article. The people that had multiple Bartonella species, Bartonella hensley with Bartonella quintana, with Bartonella vinsoni, with Bartonella elizabethae, with Bartonella baxiliformis, all these different Bartonella species. The people who had multiple Bart species and multiple Babesia 
um, Babesia microti, Babesia um, duncani, WA1. Um, and, and actually we found other Babesia species, including Otocolii, which has now been discovered by Clark in Canada, not known necessarily to be a pathogen. It showed up by fish in a couple of these people with resistant Babesia. So in this patient population, we got much better results just extending the high dose dapsone pulse by two days. But what we found is these people with multiple Barton Babesia were the ones with the worst neuropathy, the mm -hmm. worst autonomic neuropathy with POTS. Most of them had chronic variable immune deficiency and subclass deficiency. They were immune suppressed and they had the worst neuropsychiatric features. So one of the patients had psychosis with auditory hallucinations. And when mm -hmm. he took, he could not take the methylene blue because the psychiatrist would not allow him to come off the drug. So he did the quadapsone without methylene blue, meaning we had to give him a lot more antioxidants to lower the methemoglobin. His auditory hallucinations almost completely went away after a six day course. Wow. So a lot of these patients have now stayed in long-term remission. And one of the patients who is a patient with an EM rash with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, right? Which according to Hopkins and John Alcott and just, we don't know really what's causing it. I mean, mm -hmm. all deference to everybody out there, but Yes, we do. We do know what's causing it. Look at the 16 points on the MSIDS model. When you review this mm -hmm. paper and you review the paper published in Healthcare and other Dapsone articles, there are up to 16 reasons why Lyme patients stay sick. They have the three Bs, Borrelia, Babesia, and Bartonella. They have multiple sources of inflammation apart from the infections. They have microbiome abnormalities with too much Prevotella species or Clostridium or not enough Acromantia species, right? They've got mast cell disorder with problems in the gut mm -hmm. with leaky gut, causing inflammatory cytokine and chemokine production. They don't fall asleep, increasing their interleukin-6. They have mineral deficiencies with mold and heavy metal toxins. Mm -hmm. So they've got all these sources of inflammation, right? Driving an inflammatory response. And the reason Lyme patients are sick with fatigue and headaches and muscle pain and joint pain and memory and neuroscience is all from inflammation. So again, going back to Dapsone, anti-inflammatory, right? But you got to get all the sources of inflammation for this protocol to be effective. So, and Ali, you might maybe you should speak to this. What mm -hmm. MSIDS factors did you have, right, that you felt made a big difference that had really not been addressed before? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel like I had a vast variety of them. I kind of had a little bit of everything in the book. Um, and I also, just hearing you speak about this, I have specific antibody deficiency. I have POTS. Um, I have mast cell or had mast cell. I don't really know where that's at, but I don't have food reactions anymore. So we'll take that for what it is. Um, and I am somebody who really got better from this protocol. Um, I have a handful of co-infections. I have Bartonella. I have Babesia. And I want to stress something that you said, which is that Dapsone and double Dapsone, it does aid in the treatment of Babesia and Bartonella, because that is the question that I get the most is if I have co-infections, is it worth doing Dapsone? And my answer is always yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, so I know you're speaking a little bit about Babesia and Bartonella and how the drug, it just has to be hit a little bit differently. So I just want to confirm with you, number one, it is absolutely worth doing if you have co-infections. But number two, for somebody that maybe has Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella, how does that treatment look a little bit different than like the standard one if you quote unquote, like only have Lyme? Right. No, it's a great question. So the difference in this eighth Dapson article, which again, hopefully will be out soon, is that this last way we did the Dapson, the high dose Dapson went from four to, to four to six days. We extended it only mm -hmm. by two days. That two-day difference made all the difference in the world, corroborating what Hopkins had found in culture, that you needed Zithromax, Rifampin, and Methylene Blue to kill the Bart persisters, right? So it is much more effective. This is, for, and from my perspective, this is the first oral generic antibiotic short-term mm -hmm. protocol that has ever been effective for chronic Lyme and Bartonella. The biggest mm -hmm. problem is Babesia, because the only people that did not go into remission, full remission from this mm -hmm. protocol, and I want you to be clear when I say didn't go into full remission, there are some of those patients that are 87% normal or 90% yeah. or 95, they've got their lives back, but I'm considering full remission, not one symptom that you mm -hmm. had when you started. So all the patients who were Babesia fish in this last article, none of them went into full-time remission. So what I usually end up having to do for Babesia, I usually end up having to do rotations. This protocol mm -hmm. does help with Babesia, but the problem right now with Babesia all of the drugs used for Babesia, it has become resistant. 
Mepron mm -hmm. and Zithromax, it has become resistant. Clindamycin and quinine, it has become resistant. In fact, over 20 years ago, I presented at the 11th, 12th, and 13th International Scientific Conferences on Lyme, I was already finding Mepron and Zithromax and clindaquinine resistance over 20 years ago. But it was only a couple of years ago, and this was also when I was serving at HHS on the Babesian Tick-Borne Subcommittee, they found out why, that there's a genetic uh, factor that's now affecting the way the organism responds, that it's become resistant to atovaquone and to azithromycin. Mm -hmm. So I use rotations of things like coartum, lumafanthine, mm -hmm. artemether. I use a lot of ivermectin with malarone, mm -hmm. with five different herbs, cryptolepis, artemisinin, Japanese knotweed, um, Chinese skullcap, acornia. All of those were published um, on for Babesia duncani. So I'll use these herbs with malarone, ivermectin, with these coartum pulses. Um, but I also tried tofenequin in this past year with ivermectin malarone. You're going to read about this in the article. Helpful, but the problem with tofenequin, which has been published as a possible treatment for Babesia, it causes hemolytic anemia and high methemoglobin, exactly what you get from Dapsone. So you cannot use these drugs together. And even when you use them, it can be helpful, not to fenequin alone. I really found ivermectin malarone with these herbs was needed. It knocked down the load. And what I'm finding with most of these rotations of these anti-malarials is it's knocking down the load. It's like peeling an onion. Little by little, every time you hit the Babesia, you kind of knock down the load. And the reason I know that is clinically, the amount of sweats, the frequency of the sweats, mm -hmm. the intensity of the sweats or the chills or the flushing or the air hunger, the unexplained cough, those Babesia symptoms. They get better each time you do a pulse, but a lot of times you stop whatever you're pulsing, the Babesia symptoms will start to come back within a certain period of time. It is a highly resistant parasite. And one of the things I said in this new article, in this comparison of a six-day hydostapsone pulse to prior shorter four-day pulses, we need more research money invested into Babesiosis. Mm -hmm. um, I just gave a doctor training about two weeks ago. There was a drug I came across in the literature called Orlistat. It used to be used for weight loss. It stops fat absorption. They actually talked about this as something that might interfere with Babesia metabolism. Now, I'm not planning on doing this in the near future, but the point is, is I have to go diving into the medical literature to like look for answers for this stuff because I'm not getting any answers from the scientific literature. The universities are not doing enough research. And I know Yale is doing some with Dr. L. Curry and the rest. And these are really smart, great doctors. But we need more money for Babesia research because it's interfering with the success of this protocol. So- mm -hmm. Just like you had POTS, you know, if you can reverse the POTS with any hopper dynamic neural retraining and GUPTA, right? Or sometimes you need midodrine. Mm -hmm. But the point is the MSIDS factors, they have to be addressed before you do the Dapsone protocol. Because if mm -hmm. you have POTS, you're going to have resistant fatigue and brain fog and anxiety and mm -hmm. palpitations and get dizzy and have presyncope and sip be passing out. It's going to look like Lyme and smell like Lyme, but you don't treat it with antibiotics. You treat mm -hmm. it with salt and fluids and licorice and midodrine and florinef and droxydopa and vagal retraining. There's a lot of things. It's all in my book. How can I get better? It's all in all of my publications. But the point is, you've got to go after all of these MSIDS factors because these six inflammatory factors, the downstream effects are POTS, mitochondrial dysfunction. One third of these people, the mitochondria, the energy powerhouse of your cell has all this free radical oxidative stress. So when we finish the Dapsone protocol, we now do one month of a mitochondrial regeneration to repair any possible mitochondrial damage. And by the way, everyone I've checked for mitochondrial damage before doing Dapsone, they all have problems in the mitochondrial pathway. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a test called the mitoswab, and you can actually do this test and actually check your mitochondrial pathways. But the point being, you got to go after the 16 factors because Dapsone combination therapy, this nine-week initial pulse, it will not be enough if you don't discover, if you have an immune deficiency or you have POTS or your adrenals, 80 to 90% of these people, they have adrenal dysfunction. That's the battery of your body. Don't go mm -hmm. into Dapsone, right? With low adrenal function, you're going to have a hell of a time getting through the protocol, right? So before you do it, anyone listening out there, your doctor has to go through the 16-point MSIDS map, take a couple of months, and you can't have any iron deficiency or B12 deficiency, mm -hmm. and you can't be G6PD deficient glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, it's an enzyme you must have to be able to do Dapsone. I've only found a handful of people in my you know, clinical career of 35 plus years that didn't have it. But the point being, it's a great protocol. It is the most effective in 35 years. Um, and ultimately for people with BART, what is most likely going to be needed in someone like you, Ali, and we've talked about this, after mm -hmm. you do the nine-week protocol, what do you do from there? Well, 
I let people recover from the DAP zone, look, waiting for the anemia to come back to normal. And by the way, in this paper, every lab and hematological variable was studied in detail so people can see how much does your hemoglobin and hematica drop when you're on DAP zone? How high mm -hmm. do the hemoglobins level go on quad DAP zone? The good news, in this group of patients, two thirds of the patients, their methemoglobin levels were below 5% normal. You, you don't even feel less than 5% normal because the methylene blue dose was at 300 twice a day with vitamin C, vitamin E, NADH, right? All of these antioxidants and glutathione work to reverse methemoglobin. So the real issue with Dapsone is more the anemia. You've just got to mm -hmm. watch because there will be a rare person who will have hemolysis. Dapsone causes normally a low-grade hemolysis. But the average drop in hemoglobin in the study we were about to publish was about 3.5 grams. So, you know, it's nice if you can start at at least a 13, 14 hemoglobin, 12, it's a little dicey for some people if you happen to be one of these people that happens to go lower. But the average drop was 3.5 grams, but the highest was six. Now, generally, it will come back to normal quickly with massive doses of folic acid if it should drop that much. So what happens is you follow the labs carefully. If you see it drop more than it has to, you just stop Dapsone. Already in this protocol, what I did differently to account for the drops, people are now on three to four leucovorin, 25 milligrams twice a day. So they're taking about 200 milligrams of leucovorin, right, folinic acid, mm -hmm. with four folify twice a day, 60 milligrams twice a day of L-methylfolate. So I've got people on 320 milligrams of folic acid with a methyl protect from Zymogen, methyl B12, and iron. Because I had this woman from Ireland contact me and go, Doc, thank you so much for getting me out of a wheelchair. I couldn't walk before Dapsone. No, I didn't know this woman. She said, I just got to tell you, though, Dr. Jack Lambert in Ireland, he did it. I'm so grateful. You know, he used it. But I got to tell you, I did not tolerate Dapsone that the way you were using it. He, she said, but in Europe, Sanofi makes a Dapsone with iron. And I took the Sanofi brand Dapsone with iron and I noticed I tolerated it better, which didn't make much sense to me because iron pathways is not what Dapsone's affecting unless she happened to be iron deficient. But in either case, I said, okay, universe, you're providing me some extra information. I've now included in the protocol that at lunchtime, women or men will take a small dose of iron with the methyl B12. So I'm covering all the hematological pathways and lab pathways the best that I can. And it turns out that it's, it's basically a protocol that almost everyone should be able to get through but as I said, the one thing people are going to have to look for, you it's better to start at a higher hemoglobin because I don't really find the methemoglobin, the highest methemoglobin in the study, I think might have been 16 or 17 percent. And the people didn't even feel it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would stop at above 20, but dangerous is 50 to 60 percent methemoglobin. The only issue with this, with this, honestly, with this dapsone therapy, you're going to have a rare person who's going to drop the counts more than you expect. Mm -hmm. That is what people honestly, and that means your doctor should be trained in the protocol. Mm -hmm. um, we have Zoom links, by the way, we have doctor trainings we did two weeks ago. So any doctor out there who wants to learn, it's about, a, I don't know, 15, 16 hours worth of lectures. I did, you know, six modules. Neil Nathan did three on mold and vagal retraining and um, the highly sensitive patient. Tanya Dempsey did one on mast cell. Deb Hamilton did one on pediatric Lyme um, and autism disorder. Um, after, uh, Asha Gupta talked about the Gupta technique, which was recently published for long COVID. It got people's mm -hmm. fatigue four times better with a type of a neurofeedback um, amyl amygdala insular retraining. So I had all of these people on. It was a full weekend course. Doctors can learn the Dapsone protocol. You can get the Zoom links. There's a fee, but you could contact um, Heather O at hvhac.com and doctors can learn the protocol because you really should know how to do this protocol properly. Um, it's not a protocol to just jump in, but no, the entire protocol and all the details is in the published paper. So all you really have to do is follow this. And I am open if doctors call me all the time, somebody needs help with stuff, right? I'm I'm always open to helping a doctor who wants to help their patients with this, right? So there we are. Well, you are one of the most selfless people I know, that's for sure. And I want to stress a really important point for anybody watching or watching this at a later date. And that's that you have to work with a doctor that really knows the protocol and knows what they're doing and knows the, you know, the supplementary items to use to mitigate side effects because some of the questions that I get asked frequently are, um, you know, are there any risks? Is it dangerous? Is it, you know, or people that have done it and been guided to do it incorrectly? 
and I'll say, well, were you on this? Were you on that? Did, did you address MSIDS beforehand? It's, it's, it's a, you know, you're walking, it's, it's not a race um, and it doesn't happen overnight, um, but you really have to work with somebody who knows what they're doing and, and does it the right way and does it exactly as Dr. Horowitz has created this. That's a really important point that I want to stress. Um, and now we have I, the beautiful I know. Lee Horowitz who will join us. <laughs> Hi, Lee. Hello, Ali. We're both Hi. in pink. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you look lovely. Um, Lee is, for those of you that don't know Lee Horowitz, she is truly one of my favorite humans. Sorry, Dr. Horowitz. Um, Lee is a master astrologer. She is wonderful, one of the nicest people that I know. As I said at the beginning, Lee was sick for over 20 years with Lyme and tick-borne diseases and did DAP zone therapy and has been in remission for four years. So I find her greatly, greatly inspirational. And um, I'll let you take it from here, Lee, for a little bit. Oh, sure. Thank you so much for this. This is very exciting because I've been witnessing for the last 28 years my husband's evolution of all of these protocols. And over 20 years ago, I needed it myself and was happy to be the guinea pig for anything and everything. And um, I too had just about every one of these six points 16. on the 16 points on the MSIDS model. Um, and chipping away at that really like kind of gave me a, a fundamental health, like a restored health. And then the Dapsone protocol was for me the icing on the cake. Because once that happened, I um, I think uh, Doc said, Rich said, uh, I was on for six months, I was on 50 milligrams of Dapsone and then 100 milligrams for a year. And then our friend made a mistake, that fateful, excellent mistake, and took the 200 twice a day. And that that was really the game changer because for the first time in oh over 20 years, I needed no more treatment, nothing more, no herbs, no antibiotics, nothing. And um, and as long as I keep to my my diet and you know, really I listen to what I need food wise and sleep wise and um, you know, doing and resting. I think Lyme has taught me that to really listen and um, and do what's right, you know, from the inside out. Um, but I'm really very fortunate, you know, I've had him <laughs> caring for me all these years. And so I'm really lucky, lucky, lucky. And now that this treatment, this protocol has come, you know, in such a succinct way, nine weeks, and so many people are going into remission, it really is such a blessing because I just foresee hundreds of thousands, millions of people benefiting now from this. So really a blessing. I'm so happy to report that I am well. And um, I know many people who are well after this protocol. So um, as Ali said, you know, find a really great doctor. I think there's 72 healthcare practitioners who were recently trained who you can find out about from Heather O at hvhac.com. And, um, and then you'll, you're on your way. So good luck to you all. This is, I just feel so, so joyful and grateful for all the work my husband has done, how he's stuck in, you know, he's hung in there and stuck it out through thick and through thin, through up and through down. And to come to this place feels really very, um, very wonderful. So uh, happy to be here. <laughs> well, it's beautiful. And I'm, um, I feel very lucky that you share your voice and your light with us. And I just have one question. So for you, Lee, you know, you've been in remission for four years, you've kind of not actually been out of the therapy, but a little bit more re removed from it. Whereas for me, you know, I'm still treating a little bit of BART and Babesia and we're knocking out the rest of it. Um, so I'm curious for you four years out, what does your like 
do you do any maintenance? Like, what does that look like for you um, compared to like when you were, I guess, like actively treating or had active infections? I'm not sure the right way to say it, but hopefully you understand what I'm asking. Yes, yes. As far as active maintenance, um, it's really keeping healthy, eating mm-hmm. well, not having sugar, not having too many histamine. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of the things I'm still needing to work with is the histamine diet, keeping eating low histamine foods. But even doing that for two years, I'm eating anything and pretty mm-hmm. much not getting migraines or pain anymore. So, and I also say um, meditation, um, breathing, um, really watching my attitude. I've really made some major changes in how I think lately. I've watched this habit of complaining that my husband reflected back to me. And I'm just like, I realize that that creates like illness and is rather mm-hmm. poisonous. So I'm working from the inside out. Um, my thinking, my emotions, gratitude feels huge. And also staying in contact with people who I love, who I care about, having that social support, you know, all of that keeps my energy very um, like buoyant and mm-hmm. keeps the joy, you know, more prominent. And you're exercising pretty much every day. I right? walk almost every day. I stretch. Um, I'm doing the vagal retraining slowly, <laughs> but I am still doing it. You're getting to sleep earlier. I'm getting to sleep earlier. I also made a disconnected from a family member that was highly toxic. And actually, I was staying ill in mm-hmm. contact with her. She was actually my mother. And after three, three years, four years of not being in touch with her, I also am feeling better. So I don't advocate, you know, cutting off your mother unless you're she's killing you or unless you feel like you're dying around her and from her, then maybe think of it, like really think of it. So um, so it's making good choices. Um, and I have we have a puppy and there's so much puppy love and that energy is really healing. You know, I'm aware of an ongoing healing. I ground every day my bare feet on the earth, you know, when it's not too cold all these days. So that's kind of my maintenance right now. Apart from the 85 pills I make you swim. 85 pills I tell, oh, I forgot. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, God. that part of it. Oh yeah. Honestly, Any- it's good that you forgot. <laughs> I'm Kappa B, Percuplex resveratrin with Oncoplex, sulforaphane glucosinolate with MGRT to stimulate NRF2 receptors and lower inflammation, right? LDN 4.5 milligrams to stop microglial activation in the brain. Two grams of organic fish oils without mercury every day. Um, a lot of magnesium and a mineral supplement, right? You're doing lots everything, of stuff. Everything. Probio- probiotics for the gut. We're doing a lot of stuff to yes. stay healthy. Mitochondrial yes. supplements every day, mm-hmm. right? Yes. We're doing all of it. You're doing it all. <laughs> um, I do want to emphasize something that Lee said about, you know, that that positive energy. And it's it's really hard sometimes to be positive when you're sick. I have been there. I understand. Like I said, I was bedridden for two years, the whole nine yards. Um but shifting your mindset and cutting things out that you notice bring you great displeasure or great discomfort or anything that really activates like that fight or flight or that nervous system. I think it's really, really hard to heal. Even if the medications are doing its job, if you're constantly in fight or flight and your vagus nerve is overwhelmed and your nervous system is overwhelmed and how is it supposed to regulate itself? Um, so I do think that the mental piece of this, the spiritual piece of this is just as important as, as the physical in conjunction with this work. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Lee. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well said. Um, by the way, Olive, Olivia couldn't join us this evening, but Olivia Goodrow, who, um, by the way, those mm-hmm. of you probably know Olivia, she, um, founded the Live Lyme Foundation and they give grants for kids, um, who cannot afford Lyme treatments across the U S and, um, Olivia staying very, and I'm I'm very proud to say that um, Olivia, who I started treating many years ago and had done regular doses of Dapson when she was young, for I don't know maybe seven or eight years, didn't really mm-hmm. need treatment because the load of Dapson knocked down the bugs. But then things started coming back, and her Bartfish was positive, and she's given me permission to share this. Um, and she did the double dose Dapson eight weeks. She did one six day pulse Bartonella fish positive, and she's six months in full remission without one symptom that has come back. 
So she's about to start UCLA. Congratulations, Olivia. Congratulations. Um, master's in public health, maybe medicine, who knows, but but she's another person, um, you know, and she's in this article. She's actually one of the 25. Um, and she allowed me to share her story because any of these patients that are Bartonella fish positive who said, gee, the Lyme's one thing, but what about Bart? It's so difficult to kill. This protocol that, again, I'm hoping the editor told me it, it has been accepted. Um, and I'll be speaking, by the way, at ILADS this year in Boston. I will be presenting on this paper um, at ILADS next month. So for those of you, if you have not attended ILADS before and want to get the updated information, please uh, come to ILADS this year. And uh, I'm ha happy to speak to you and share some information. So Ali, do you have others that um, wanted to come online and speak a little? You know, um, let me see who's on. If you don't mind, though, I do have a handful of patient questions that I think are good to address if you have time for a couple more. Sure. The only thing is at 635, I have a Zoom conference with an, Australia, with an Australian reporter okay. from major TV network about Lyme in Australia. So well, I have, have a hard, hard stop at 635. Um, let me, well, I'm going to ask you my question. I'm going to see if um, the other person who was supposed to join is on. And if not, um, we'll just have to either do this again or have patient testimonials, which I'm always happy to collect. Um, somebody had asked, which was a great question to bring up about how you handle these antibiotics and this intense of a protocol with the gut. Um, I can say from my own experience that I have an incredibly sensitive gut. As I said, when I started this, I could not eat solid food. And Dr. Horowitz put me on um, basically a gut regimen and a probiotic regimen that really kept me in check during this. But do you mind speaking a little bit to that? Sure. I mean, so for some people, um, it, it turns out that they need upper gut healing um, and a little bit of lower gut healing. So for example, um, Zymogen makes a product, glutalamine, it's, glutal, it's glutamine, aloe vera, and deglycerinated licorice. So for some people that need extra GI support, um, that can be helpful. And then they make a product called OptiCleanse GHI. GHI stands for gastric hepatic intestinal. So for people, for example, that have hypoglycemia, their blood sugars are swinging, they need a protein drink, but they also need lower gut support, intestinal support, we might use that. Um, and for people with mast cell disorder um, regarding the gut, we will use things like DAO enzymes, diamine oxidase to degrade histamine. Um, a lot of these people with mast cell disorders that affect their gut, they may need to be on chromalin sodium, gastrochrome. So, you know, it depends on what's going on with your gut. But a lot of these patients, and we published this in the article, had leaky gut with multiple food sensitivities. So one of the first things it's even LabCorp does this. It's a 95 IgG4 food allergy profile from LabCorp. Um, you can also get a zonulin level to see if you have leaky gut. So regarding the gut, you want to really first know, do you have mast cell? You're going to need some extra mast cell support. Do you have leaky gut? Um, you can do a CDSA, a comprehensive digestive stool analysis, and look actually at your gut, look at the microbiome, see what's going on. But the protocol we used of using Therolac for master supplements twice a day, which is 40 to 60 billion of five separate strains. These strains, by the way, were all found in octogenarians who lived the longest on the planet. Um, it's in a capsule. Uh, they got FDA support for this, that 95% of this 40 to 60 billion makes it into the lower tract. So we use Therolac, we use Saccharomyces boulardii, which has been published to stop C. diff diarrhea. I use Orthobiotic, which is again, a blend of Bifidobacterium, Lactobacillus, and this latest protocol I'm now using, the Probiomax 350 billion from Zymogen, which has 16 different strains, which are all acid resistant that get into the lower colon. Um, and many of these have been published to have huge beneficial effects, including, by the way, lowering down inflammation. So we, you know, I've been playing around with probiotics and these protocols for a long time. I have not had a case of C. diff in my office in years. Um, and generally, if you take the antibiotics with a full stomach, and the way this protocol works is you start with like Plaquenil, Minnow, Nystatin, and a couple of days later, you add Rifampin. And if your stomach's okay, you add Pyrazinamide. And if your stomach's okay, um, you keep going, then you add, or start with Dapsone. Mm -hmm. And then month two, you add Zithromax. But the point is, I gradually introduce the antibiotics and you listen to your body. How is my stomach doing? Do I need more probiotics? Should I add another half packet of Probiomax? So these probiotics, with different gut support. Again, it's usually mast cell support and leaky gut support with sometimes, again, things like glutalamine or OptiCleanse GHI. 
that kind of support usually gets most people through this protocol. Um, but there are some people that need to spend a few months before they start any antibiotics, healing the gut, getting the gut in mm -hmm. order. Um, they, they may have multiple chemical sensitivity with detoxification problems. Mm -hmm. They got to open up their detox pathways and unload the mold and unload the metals before they even start. Now, that's why it's individualized in medicine, right? There's no two patients for the same, but but that's basically the gut protocol that we do. Um, and I don't really find the GI tract to be a problem. Most people, as long as they go low and slow and build up, usually this protocol has been very well tolerated. Yes, and I and I just want to say, even though Dr. H has to go um, shortly, I am more than happy to stay on and answer questions about my own personal experience because I see a lot of those here. But I want to get to the medical questions while we have them for a few more minutes because I do not have that brain, nor do you want me to. Um, people are also asking, and I, I think, I don't know if there's a way to tell this, but knowing you, there probably is. Um, is Dapsone and double Dapsone effective in all strains of Babesia? Well, first of all, Babesia, it's much more effective for Lyme and Bartonella. Okay. The, the, the double dose and high dose protocol, it has some efficacy with Babesia, but not great. It, it okay. ranges in the last Dapsone study I published in this new one, somewhere between 18 and 33%. I mean, it's not great, but does it help with Babesia? Do some people go into remission? Yes. But Babesia, as I mentioned earlier, is the parasite. It's the bug mm -hmm. that's causing resistance to this protocol. A lot of the people who are not going into long-term remission, it's basically because Babesia is still hanging around and you need to keep doing these anti-malarial rotations to knock it out. So um, that is, in fact, the parasite is, that's the biggest problem I'm having with this protocol right now. But the advantage of this new one, of the longer pulse of high-dose dapsone, six days versus the shorter course of four, is that the six-day pulse is turning out to be much more effective for Bartonella, again, corroborating what John Hopkins researchers had found in culture. Um, is there, sorry, I have two other questions I'm gonna hit you with and then I will, I will let you leave. Um, for patients that are on psychiatric medications and unfortunately cannot come off of those medications to take Dapsone slash double Dapsone, um, where you really need that methylene blue to balance out the, and mitigate side effects, do you notice patients that are unable to take the methylene blue, them having any kind of a different experience versus patients who are able to take the methylene blue? So, you know, I don't have enough of a patient population of a large enough population because almost everyone who's done this protocol has done it with methylene blue. But as I mentioned in when I, earlier, there was one patient, and you'll read about him in the study when it gets published, who had Bartonella with psychosis, um, auditory hallucinations, um, really great kid. Um, and, and he's been sick for a long time and he's way better. And he did it without methylene blue. But the way we dealt with the methemoglobin is we basically gave her more glutathione. Now, normally the doses of glutathione I use in this protocol usually are about a thousand milligrams twice a day, but you can go up to 2000, but you can do 2000 three times a day. And one of the other things I would do in someone like this, I'd use cimetidine. So what, there's a drug and I mentioned it in the article, but we didn't routinely use it in all of the patients. Cimetidine is the first H2 blocker like Zantac and Pepsid that ever came out. And it turns out the side effect of Zapsone, it's because of an N methylation pathway with Dapsone. And when you give cimetidine, it actually makes it more tolerable. But what happens with cimetidine, it has drug interactions. So you have to lower your Plaquenil to once a day. Mm -hmm. But someone like that who could not take methylene blue, I would definitely put them on cimetidine. I'd use glutathione doses probably 2,000 three times per day on the highest doses of Dapsone with at least 2,000 of vitamin C twice a day, 300 of vitamin E twice a day, and NADH five milligrams twice a day, maybe even 10 twice a day. In other words, I would push all the antioxidants that are known to reverse methemoglobin since I can't use methylene blue. But the problem of not using it is methylene blue is a persister drug. It doesn't just lower methemoglobin. It's a persister drug for Lyme and for Bartonella. So if you have BART, and you're doing it without methylene blue, I'm not sure the protocol would be as effective. It's still, you still might get some positive effects, but I doubt you might get the same long-term remission rates. And that's why I tell people, you've really got to get off the site drugs to be able to do this protocol. And I've had a couple of people tell me that they can't and we do our best with it, but otherwise they've chosen not to do the protocol, which for me is a shame because ultimately the Lyme and the Bart and the Babesia are driving these neuropsychiatric reactions.
So the patients that are afraid to come off the drugs because they're worried that they're about to decompensate, you should be doing six months of a neurofeedback like the Gupta technique, the AIR mm -hmm. technique, amygdala insulin retraining, any hopper dynamic neural retraining, um, do cognitive behavioral therapy, do EMDR, um, meditate, do whatever you need to heal your mind and learn to stay in a stable emotional state because really this protocol is a lot better with methylene blue. And if you feel your mind is not stable, then you need to be doing six months or whatever, how long it takes to stabilize your mind on your own, working with therapists, doing these techniques, mm -hmm. and then taper off the psych drugs and do the protocol. That would be my advice to you. Um, we've used low dose methylene blue at 50 twice a day without seeing serotonin syndrome. We have used mm -hmm. low dose, but low dose, low dose methylene blue is not gonna kill BART. That I'm gonna tell you for sure. It is the higher dose of the methylene blue. One of the patients in the study you'll read about was paralyzed from the waist down for the last eight years and could not move the muscles in her legs. She did a quad dapsone. She's still not done a six day high dose dapsone. She's done quad. But when she got the methylene blue up to 300 twice a day for the first time in all the years I'd been treating her, her muscles started moving in her legs. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? Like, not. I'm not talking like we're jumping up and down. I'm talking though, there was no movement, complete paralysis. And all of a sudden the muscles were twitching and there was some movement. It was like, are you trying to tell me that Bartonella has been there the whole time causing part of this paralysis? What? So I don't know the end of this story. That'll be a whole nother documentary if this woman gets up and starts to walk. Um, all I'm telling you is there's some fascinating things that when you read the study, fascinating things about just moving the methylene blue dose to 300 twice a day, Extending the dapsone dose by two days at high dose dapsone at 400 made all the difference in the world with these Bartonella patients. But again, 16 point MSIDs, go after Babesio rotations, mm -hmm. work on your mind and all these other things, diet exits like Lee was taught. I mean, that's what you're going to need to do to get this protocol uh, to make it the most effective possible. But Lyme community, you should have hope. I've been working on this for yeah. 35 years. You might say, Doc, yeah. what took you so long? Why didn't you feel, it's like, I know I apologize. I apologize, <laughs> I've been looking. But this year when I went data mined, it took me by the way, 200 hours to do this study, to write this study up and do all the revisions. It wasn't until I did the data mining of these 25 patients, 84% who had BART, the light bulb went off when I reviewed the studies and it went, oh my God, we finally figured it out. Not that it's a full cure for everybody on the first round, but 43% remission, that's like a batting average at the, you know, you first at bat home run, 430 batting average. And then mm -hmm. afterwards, if you don't go in full remission, pulse every eight weeks, mm -hmm. you do a two week pulse with only six to seven days of Dapsone. Once you've gotten through this protocol, you're done with long-term Dapsone. You're talking six or seven days. So this protocol gets easier as it goes forward. And what it showed in the medical literature, and this is in the article, Two good articles came out, one of them this year with a mathematical model showing you need to pulse your persister drugs to get rid of the persisters mm -hmm. under the biofilms. So docs out there who are using continuous antibiotics all the time, you are not gonna wipe out the persisters. It has to be pulsed and it has to be using multiple persister drugs and biofilm agents at the same time. And that is what we've mm -hmm. accounted for in this new Dapsone article. So like, this is really exciting for me. I mean, and I'm ready for an FDA trial. So I will be approaching the Lyme groups, including Project Lyme by the end of this year. And I'm gonna be getting the CDC on the line. I'm gonna be going to the other side with the IDSA. Anybody who wants to join, Gary Worms or Alan Steer, Datweiler, any of them who want to join the conversation, because this is gonna be the first randomized controlled trial for Lyme in over 15 years. I want the IDSA perspective. So when people succeed with this protocol, you don't come back to me and say, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? They're all gonna have an opportunity to sit at the table. Okay, I'm bridging here. So it's up to them now to come to the table and be mentions mm -hmm. and say, hey, okay, the literature's there. There's animal models, there's biofilm models and culture. You've got 400 Dapsone patients. I can see where a randomized trial is warranted. These are the questions I have for you. So I'm hoping we're going to have that open conversation at the end of the year. And um, God bless you, Ali, for going through this and for sharing this with people. And uh, I've got to get on with Australia, but um, oh. please, please stay on. And um, yeah. you know, we can have another time, even with other patients coming on, because there's a lot of patients yeah. now who are in, I mean, in years of remission at this point from the protocol. So uh, maybe people want to hear you know, other stories too. So 
Thank you yes, for giving they me the do. opportunity. And we'll, we'll get to some of those at the end. And I know that you have to go um, Zoom with Australia, which just speaks to the knowledge that you have. But thank you for everything, Dr. H. And I will list all of the resources at the end of this chat. I'm going to stay on for another 10 minutes um, and answer questions about my depth zone journey and rattle off a bunch of resources for people. But thank you. And please thank Lee for me. I will. Okay. God bless everyone. Bye, Dr. H. Take care. Blessings to everyone. Bye-bye. So for anybody listening, um, I know that Dr. H had to jump a little bit early because he had a national um, news opportunity that came up last minute, um, quite literally broadcasted to Australia, which is a very big deal. Um, so there are a couple of things I wanted to address that were more of questions for me, which I am happy to answer. So somebody had asked um, if patients can't swallow pills or capsules, what should they do? And I was one of those patients. Um, I could not swallow anything without throwing it back up. And I mean, I still just with all of the pills that are a part of Dapsone struggle. Um, so Dr. Horowitz had told me to take the pills in a thick liquid, which for me does keep them down. So like either a really thick smoothie or like a coconut yogurt, um, applesauce, anything like that works. Um, so another question um, that somebody was kind enough to ask was asking that the study hadn't been published yet. So just to be clear, there is quite a bit of peer reviewed research on Dapsone and Double Dapsone already. If you just pop it in um, like Dapsone or Double Dapsone um, with you know Dr. Horowitz study or Dr. Horowitz research and that will come up and you can read it for yourself. Um, he has been working on an 88 page study that hopefully will be published in the coming months. Um, that will give people a little bit more insight into Dapsone. Um, somebody had asked me if I ever experienced headaches or head pressure as a part of my Lyme and tick-borne disease journey. Yes, I did. Thankfully, I never experienced like intense migraines, but I did get headaches. Um, I had blurry vision. I had ringing in my ears. And thankfully, those have really dissipated for me. Um, let me go through some of the other questions and just make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, if you want to take the MSIDS questionnaire or keep up with Dr. Horowitz's latest research, actually there is um, a page on the Project Lyme website under resources where you can find the MSIDS questionnaire along with a bunch of other um, information on Dapsone and Double Dapsone. I will also say the Project Lime Instagram has some really awesome videos that break down Dapsone um, that are really easy to save to your page, share with you know family and friends who maybe don't understand what you're going through or the type of treatment or why you need that treatment. Um, and it makes it into really digestible little bites for you. Um, so if you're looking for a list of physicians that are trained in Dapsone therapy by Dr. Horowitz, it isn't listed publicly. I will repeat this um, slowly for you. You will email Heather, who is his office administrator. She is absolutely wonderful, and she can send you a full list of Horowitz-trained physicians that do Dapsone and double Dapsone. Her email is heathero at hvhac.com. That is H-E-A-T-H-E-R-O at H-V-H-A-C dot com. And she'll get you that list sent over. Um, somebody had also asked me if I experienced brain fog and memory loss and if I still experienced those. Yes, um, I did at 21. I essentially lost my memory. Um, it was very, very challenging. And that's kind of when it hit me and hit my family, who thankfully has been very, very supportive. Um, and really the reason that I've gotten better, um, that's when it hit us that something was really, really wrong with me because I should not be losing my memory at 21. Um, I had my speech impacted, my word recall impacted, um, just complete memory loss, um, like the type where, you know, if it wasn't literally right in front of me, I had no idea and I could not recollect it. Um, I do still have a little bit of brain fog um, and a little bit of memory loss. And that is why 
I say, you know, I'm 80 to 85% better, but I'm not 100% better yet. And that's why I will be doing another pulse of double and quad daptone. Um, and if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to answer it. However, my memory and my brain fog is immensely better than it was. But as we all know, um, you know, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and we will absolutely get there. Um, can you tell us about how you felt from day to day going through the Dapsone protocol? So for me, I am very, very sensitive to medication, as I'm sure a lot of us are. And it took me a little bit longer to work up to actually taking the full Dapsone protocol of the Dapsone medication, plus all of the other drugs that you take with it, um, and then adding in the supplements. So when I first started, I will not lie, I did not feel good. Um, I was exhausted. I pretty much had chronic nausea the entire time that I did Dapsone. But thankfully for me, that's as bad as it got. Um, typically when I've done Lyme and tick-borne disease treatment in the past, just to be clear, what's not with Dr. Horowitz, um, I am a huge nausea and vomiting person. I vomit a lot. It's how I herx. Um, I can happily say that I did not have any vomiting throughout this protocol, which is pretty amazing. And I really credit that to how Dr. Horowitz works you up to Dapsone. He doesn't just do it all at one time and like completely overload your body. He um, really works it little by little so that you're not overwhelmed. Um, I will say if you are doing Dapsone or double Dapsone, you know, let your friends know, let your family know, let, you know, if work is understanding, let work know or take time off, take a leave of absence because one day you do feel great and the next day um, you can feel terrible. Um, and it's just how it goes. And that's, you know, any protocol, any treatment of tick-borne illness. Um, I will say by the time I got to double Dapsone, similar to Lee, as you know, she was saying, as, as Dr. H was saying, um, I actually felt really good on double Dapsone and it was the best that I felt this whole time um, or the whole time that I was on it, which is, you know, I, you know, I'm not quite sure why, but it really, really worked for me. And I will say if you try Dapsone or double Dapsone, um, and you're doing it with a Horowitz trained provider, stick it out because it really does help. Um, what's the frequency of quad dap zone? Um, so I did a short pulse of quad dap zone and it's simply because I have Bartonella, Babesia and a handful of other co-infections. I did it for seven days um, and it actually was pretty tolerable for me. So I can't say anything bad about it. Um, Daniela, yes, I did the full protocol. I did Dapsone, I did double Dapsone, and then I did quad Dapsone. Um, somebody had asked me what treatments I did before doing Dapsone. Um, if you name a therapy, I probably did it. Um, the only one that I have not done that I know a handful of people have tried in the community is disulfram. I was never a candidate for that. Um, but pretty much anything else, you know, I did. And I do think treating Lyme and tick-borne illness, it's like peeling an onion, right? Even if you do Dapsone, double Dapsone, there's still things you have to do beforehand, like addressing MSIDs, POTS, any kind of immune deficiency, so on and so forth. Um, um, I will say too, for anyone that is doing Dapsone or double Dapsone um, and is going to do it with Dr. Horowitz or any of their providers, advocate for anything that makes your life easier and lessens the burden of the herxing, right? So for me, I had constant nausea and Dr. Horowitz was the first doctor who ever looked at me and said, you don't have to be nauseous. I'm going to give you Zofran, right? So you can get through this. Um, I know it's challenging. I know that we have had to advocate for ourselves through this whole healing and illness journey, um, but don't stop, um, whether it's with him, who he's very gracious, he's happy to help in any way he can, or other, you know, MDs and providers, ask for things that will make this better and will make you um, more equipped to get through it. Um, I think that, you know, there's this, um, you know, air sometimes um, in our healing journeys that we have to suffer. And, you know, we've suffered enough. 
if we can make our lives better or even a little bit easier, we should absolutely do that. You don't have to suffer unnecessarily. Um, all right, I, th I think this is the last question that I'm gonna answer and then I'm gonna list some resources. Um, somebody had asked, how much time does he give you between DAP zone, quad DAP zone, and then pulsing? Um, I think that this is very, you know, person specific, as he had said before. Um, so for me, I did um, DAP zone, and then I went right into double DAP zone, but it's because for my system, that's what was easiest versus taking the drugs, coming off of the drugs. Um, and then, you know, having to get used to them all over again. Um, after I did Dapsone, double Dapsone, quad Dapsone, which I went one right into the next, I took a break for about a month before I did another pulse of double Dapsone. Um, and for me, like I said before, it's because of the Bartonella and Babesia that I'm having to do another pulse um, of this. So this in total, my next pulse will be my third pulse of double DAP zone. Um, and that seems to be fairly normal. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But like I said, I think it's very, very person um, specific. So I wanted to give you some resources um, that hopefully will help. Um, so number one at projectlime.org under the resources tab, there is a symptom questionnaire. And this is the MSIDS model that is published in peer-reviewed medical journals. Um, it's a 38-point assessment to identify sources of infection, you know, immune dysfunction, any symptoms you may have, anything that needs to be addressed um, before you, you know, might start Dapsone or double Dapsone. Um, the second resource that I wanted to give you is the Project Lime Instagram account. Um, which maybe Noah will so kindly drop for me in the chat. They provide a lot of great information, not just on Dapsone, but on all different, um, you know, things with Lyme, Lyme disease, so on and so forth. And like I said, there is a really awesome um, video on there on Dapsone and double Dapsone that's super easy to share. Um, the third resource that I would love to give you, which um, originated as a part of Project Lyme, is Generation Lyme. Um, it's another nonprofit that, like I said, originally powered by Project Lyme, which I'm very, very grateful for. Um, they host a vast variety of support groups. They're all online. And um, I just think it's great to be able to connect with other people. Um, I know it's in person, but it's virtual COVID, post-COVID world feels like it's in person, even though it's virtual, um, to chat with each other and uplift each other. And it's one of those things where I always say you don't get it until you get it, right? We often feel so isolated and so alone when we're battling Lyme and tick-borne illness, especially because there's such a lack of understanding from the medical community, from our family and from our friends, um, that I think it's great to have somebody else, you know, to talk to about this. I wanna emphasize the fact that you are not alone in this journey. There are people like me out there, you know, that totally understand what you're going through. And, um, you know, we're just happy to be a resource. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is, um, which I didn't get a chance to say at the beginning, but I, you know, I've been sick for nine years and through this process, I realized how um, marginalized this community is. Um, how much support we need to have, you know, in the future, hopefully correct, accurate and accessible diagnostics and treatment. Um, I think that uh, I shouldn't say I think I know that Project Lyme is a major piece in that, you know, probably um, a very long, lengthy and in-depth battle. Um, I am honored to now sit on the Project Lyme board. Um, I can say firsthand from seeing every aspect of the organization that um, they have the best interest of the patient at heart. Um, everyone who is involved, either themselves, their child, their spouse has Lyme and co um, and is very personally invested in this battle. So I really would love for you to stay in touch with Project Lyme. 
um, you know, come to our virtual events, hang out with us on Instagram, so on and so forth. And like I said before, um, I am here to be a resource, to be a friend, you know, to listen. Um, and if you have any questions, please, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I have raised, you know, over the last seven or eight years, over a half million dollars um, privately for Lyme disease research. And, you know, I pray, plan to raise a lot more for Project Lyme to help advance um, treatment, diagnostic and testing and patient resources for this community. Um, I've had the pleasure over the last handful of years, you know, of meeting thousands of patients across the US and hearing their story and knowing, you know, what matters most. Um, so I've become very educated on the illness and what this community needs. Um, so like I said before, if you ever have a question or need anything, please feel free to DM me on Instagram at Allie T. Moresco. That is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, it might take me a couple of days and you'll definitely get a chaotic voice note back. Um, but like I said, always here. And um, when we send out this video link to anyone that subscribed um, to join today, hopefully we can also put these resources in that email as well as the email to reach out to Heather for the list of um, DAP zone um, specialists that have been personally trained by Dr. H as well as the link to the Project Lyme MSIDS questionnaire so that you can find that right on the Project Lyme website. And we'll have to do this again, um, hopefully with Dr. Horowitz and continue to answer more questions. My apologies that we could not get to all of them, um, but there is only so much time. So thank you so much to everybody for joining and hopefully we will see you again soon. Bye guys.